Welcome to the inaugural episode of the DLC Book Club, or I guess I should call it DLC Literary Club or Literature Club, because then that would be DLC again. But, you know, literature, literary, it's, uh, it sounds so formal. It's, it's going to be fun. This is a book club. Uh, I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm here with Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I am so excited to kick this off. Uh, I have enjoyed talking to you about books the few times that we've done it in mm -hmm. various other venues. And now we're convening to actually have a little book club and, and talk about first the uh, a book series, a, a, a book and a book series that mm -hmm. I have been meaning to tackle for literally a decade. And uh, I'm so glad that this is going to give me the opportunity to finally do that. Um, we are, of course, doing the Malazan Books of the Fallen. The first book is called Gardens of the Moon. These are the 10 book series written by Steven Erickson. There are other ancillary books. We're going to focus, at least for now, just on the first one. It's a lot to tackle. Uh, and part of the reason that I wanted to do this is because these books and this series have, and, and this first book in particular, have a reputation of being very dense and very hard to get into. And I figured, what better way to force me to do it uh, than uh, have uh, content around <laughs> it? Uh, so I am delighted. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking with you, Lana. And, and first, before we even get into Gardens of the Moon, I want to talk to you a little bit about just reading in general and your, uh, I know you're a reader, you love reading, but I just to sort of give people context what kinds of books do you gravitate to and maybe name your favorite book of all time, if you can oh. pick one. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad that I get to try and think of which one my favorite one of all time is. Or, now. you know, like uh, you can <laughs> what, name a couple or whatever, just anytime, favorite books. Yeah. Anytime somebody says a favorite book of all time, I always say my favorite book of all time in, in this minute, because it yeah. could be different if you ask me tomorrow, if I remembered, oh yeah, I actually like this other book. So uh, a bit about my my reading history. I've always gravitated towards um, uh, fiction books, fantasy, sci-fi, love, love those worlds. So the Malazan, is that how we're saying it? Malazan? Yeah. I mean, these books are so, <laughs> they're so uh, hard to get into that most people don't even pronounce them correctly. The author's <laughs> like, no, it's Malazan. Yeah. It looks like Malazan and you hear mm -hmm. a lot of people say Malazan, but anytime Steven Erickson is interviewed, he calls them Malazan. The idea is it's the city of Malaz mm -hmm. and these are the Malazan people. So it's like, mm, you know, uh, Los Angelinos or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Malazans, Canadians. Okay. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Americans. That, that, you know, makes my brain sit right. Yeah. Um, Probably the first books that like really, really impacted me growing up. I probably started reading Stephen King when I was a little too young, but he's <laughs> always been like, uh, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon was my first Stephen King novel that I read. And it was about a girl who was my age getting lost in the forest and dealing with horror horrific things because it's Stephen King. But I loved it. I loved it, uh, which is weird because I don't like horror or anything else, but I love, I love Stephen. Um, uh, more recently, the books I've been... Uh, sort of in university, I kind of took a break from everything, mostly because I was so broke, I couldn't afford anything. And I know books are cheap, but that just should show you how broke I was. Um, but I did read uh, sort of the Dune novels, love Dune. Um, and then uh, sort of, I think, fantasy, like modern dweeb classics. <laughs> uh, Patrick <laughs> Rothfuss, Name of the Wind, um, yeah. books. Wiseman's and Fear. Wiseman's Fear, yeah, yeah. excellent. And then... Um, through the pandemic, I read all of the Expanse novels, which oh, cool. uh, I really enjoyed those. And if you've only watched the show, they done they done some of those characters dirty. You got to get in those oh, books; yeah? they're great. Yeah, so uh, it's like a very light, 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 light history. And if I'm not reading fantasy or sci-fi, I'm reading like uh, comedy biographies, like uh, biographies yeah. of comedians. Those are like my two top genres. Have you had you heard anything about Malazan before I presented this project to you? Never, which I'm really surprised about because I do, you know, uh, my friends are all into fantasy novels as well. Fantasy sci-fi. I've never heard anybody mention it. I'm sure if I, there's like a couple people I think of, I'm like, oh, yeah, they've read it for sure. I'm going to ask them about it. But no, <laughs> I've never 
never heard of these books before. It feels to me uh, from the outside looking in, like it's sort of like that band that other bands love, you know, the band that all the <laughs> other bands cite as being like the greatest band of all time, but mm -hmm. never really broke through and became this massive mainstream hit. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it, that's my sense of the Malazan books is that the, the people like super steeped in fantasy uh, love it. And, uh, but most people, you know, most people know Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and Wheel of Time and Brandon Sanderson stuff. But like, this is sort of under the radar for most people. And to be honest, that's kind of why, one of the reasons I'm really drawn to it is that, you know, it's sort of the hipster, <laughs> cool kid you know it's hard to get into it's off-putting it's uh, somewhere between like that hipster off-putting like zone or like the kind of book that like the premise of it just a general premise of it is like the intense fantasy series that's actually written for the movie to be based around like whatever the fake fantasy series is is isn't that show you know this is the cones of dunshire of fantasy <laughs> <Right>. series <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so anyway, I mean, I, I knew really nothing about the books going in other than their reputation. And I, you know, I, we've talked, you and I've talked a lot about how I agonize over what to read next. Um, I also read a lot of Stephen King as a kid, probably way too young, um, mm -hmm. just like devoured Stephen King and tried to get into other, horror, like tried to read Peter Straub and, and like, you know, um, they have one who's crossover the other guy? book that's so good. <laughs> But Dean Koontz was the other oh, yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, the Talisman, is that what you're talking about? No, oh, well, they did The Talisman, but Black House is so good. Oh, I haven't read that one. Oh, I love so The Talisman. <laughs> um, anyway, I've kind of fallen out of favor with uh, Stephen King. I read, I read 11, 22, 60, whatever that was, the one about the assassination. And mm -hmm. like, it starts so strong and then just completely craps mm. in the bed by the end. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about Stephen King, but you know, I, I love Lord of the Rings. I got into Lord of the Rings really young. I got into the foundation oh, yes. novels really young. And anyway, um, I, I, had, I had sort of heard about these books, but it, I'd been agonizing over what to read. And I finally was like, you know what? I want to do this and asked you to do it. So we'll, what we will do here on this first episode is we'll talk a little bit about our expectations going in and sort of our general thoughts about the reputation, how it meets our, you know, actual experience with it. And then we will have a clear delineation before we talk about spoilers. So if you haven't read up to uh, the midway point, which is kind of where we both are, we're both about, we're both reading on Kindles and we're both, uh, our Kindles tell us we're about 50% of the way through Gardens of the Moon which is, oh yeah, there's your Kindle right there. We stopped um, on this page. <laughs> yes, book four, Assassins, which is always uh, a little confusing when you have a 10 book series and then in <laughs> the, each book, it has books. Yeah. That's not easy to <laughs> reference. Hard to talk about. Somebody, <laughs> yeah, somebody talk messaged about. me on Instagram who's like from the DLC community being like, oh, I want to pick it up. Where did you guys stop? And I wanted to be like, oh, book four. But I'm like, Oh, that sounds like we read four of the books. Already. <laughs> <laughs> right. In book one, we read through book four. Eh, yeah. It's hard. to. But again, <laughs> it's it's called Malazan. You know, everything about this is just, you know, it's it's you got to be you got to really want it. And I don't know if your edition had the foreword by Stephen Erickson or if you read that, but hmm. he has this in, in sort of uh, more modern editions. I think he did it in the mid 2010s or something. He uh, updated with a new foreword where he's literally like, everybody tells me this first book is hard to get into. I can rewrite it, but eh, I kind of <laughs> like that. I kind of like that people find it hard to get into. Um, anyway, so like, you know, that's the reputation of this thing. But I, I'm drawn to that. I'm like, ah, oh, I want a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I also uh, used uh, and forwarded, forwarded to you very late unfortunately i'm sorry about that but i no, also thanks. used a um there's a google doc that's floating around the internet i'll put a link uh, in the show notes or in the description of this uh video um so if you if you want to use it um yourself you can check it out it's really well done it's i mean there's a few <laughs> grammatical errors in the in the google doc <laughs> but it basically kind of recaps each chapter uh, section by section and does it in a way where you, you're guaranteed not to get any spoilers because it's literally like you have to click for it. It's like a, um, 
like a slideshow and you have to click forward to see the next little bit of information. And it's really good about highlighting important stuff. And I don't usually, um, you know, use reading aids when I'm reading, but I felt like, oh, this is going to be a book that I really need that for. So my first question to you, Lana, is kind of knowing going in the reputation of Gardens of the Moon, mm -hmm. did you find it difficult to get into? Um, I'll say yes and no, Mo mostly no, surprisingly no. I will say even the fact that we are like 50% of the way through this book, this is our first time talking about it, I think should be indicative of how surprise, like based upon the reputation, not challenging, it actually ended up being. Uh, you sent me that thing very late, but I also, I, I opened it up and I started going through it and I was immediately like, yeah, 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 I got all that. And so right. I actually stopped re using, reading it. Because I kind of want to, <laughs> you are very, what I think of as like reading smart. You're very like studious in the way you read, even like DLC slow. yesterday. Slow. The word you're, slow is the, <laughs> the correct one. But you have like the right words to talk about English, like, you know, adverb, et cetera. <laughs> and I'm like very reading dumb. It's like all of that special information that we learned in English class got ejected from my brain. It was replaced with video games. So, well, this will be an interesting dynamic, I feel. Um but I almost feel like it, it's like the opposite of Brandon Sanderson, where Brandon <laughs> Sanderson, I'm like, move this along. Yeah. This this author has like ultimate trust in the reader of, yeah, you'll get it. Just keep reading. And I do think that the first book within these books was the most challenging because it was like exposition without exposition, a bunch of setup without seemingly can anything connected just popping between a bunch of different stuff that I, you know, I won't dive in too deep, but it pretty quickly, I think after that smooths out into spending more time with each character and pretty quickly becomes much more like putting the pieces together parsable. So even though while I was reading it, it was challenging. I felt like I would stop reading the book and I'd be like, yeah, I can identify every event that happened. I can, ident I know all the key characters, I think. And then by this 50% mark, all it definitely feels like, yes, all these pieces are coming together as this book goes on. Yeah. So based upon my expectation, I kind of expected us to be like 10% of the way through this book being like, oh, do you understand? Like parsing through documents, trying to like, yeah, like red yarn things together or give ourselves any like a mutual understanding of like working through it together. But I really feel... um that the I yeah, the only impression I get is that the author has confidence that you'll get it. You just got it, you just gotta keep reading and you, yeah. it'll come together. I promise. I completely agree. And uh, I it, it is the other thing that I'm pleased to report is that it's really entertaining. You mm -hmm. know, like I was worried that it was gonna be this slog of like, well, it's not gonna get good. And you know how you, people say that about TV shows, <laughs> like you gotta watch the first season. The first season's gonna be terrible. Just but watch by 52 the episodes. Season, you're gonna <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I really thought it was going to be a real slog and it was just, it wasn't going to be fun, but I mean, almost right away, I was drawn in and having a good time. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, it is the truth that the prologue happens and then immediately like seven years later and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. And we, you know, and, and it doesn't, you don't really, nothing is spelled out for you. And I've, I've been watching a lot of booktubers talking about Malazan and the thing that people keep saying is he doesn't hold your hand. He doesn't hold your hand. And I guess that's accurate, but I don't think that really kind of describes it to me. I think that what is one of the things that Erickson tends to do frequently, at least in the first half of this first book is we, you know, we shift points of view very frequently. Uh, and he loves to do this thing where he will describe something from that character's point of view who doesn't know what is really going on, even though the reader would. Like he, the character is describing looking at someone and not mm -hmm. knowing who it is. A figure stood at the thing. And you as the reader are like, well, who is it? Later on, you realize who it was and you knew who that person was the whole time mm -hmm. because you'd experienced them before, but the character didn't. And so there's these long periods of kind of not being in the dark about what's happening because the character whose point of view you're inside is in the dark. Mm -hmm. And he loves to do that, you know, 
two men stood at the thing and one wore a long trench coat and the other, you know, and it's like, well, who are they? I don't know who they are yet. And you, you got to, like you said, you got to kind of keep reading. And then you realize, oh, that is somebody I al I'm already familiar with. Mm -hmm. I just, the character who's describing them isn't familiar with them yet. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that in the book of not just characters, but situations or um, one, the character whose point of view are inside is reading a situation incorrectly like mm -hmm. making assumptions that aren't actually true, but because they are working with limited information, that is what has is presented to the reader. And so you're like, your job is to sort of parse all that and realize, oh, I actually, as the reader, have more information than this character does. Mm -hmm. And there's something really exciting about that, but it's also like, mm -hmm. you have to be patient because you know, as you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you're like, I'm not really clear on what's going on. And then all of that floods back in and you go, ah, okay. Oh, that was Whiskey Jack the whole time or mm -hmm. whatever, you know? Yeah. The, uh, I do just want to touch on one of the things that you said like for expectations when people are like, this is the most challenging book series to read of all time, eh, whatever. I was like, how, how much is that code for poorly written? Right. Oftentimes it is. Yeah. What, what did you think? I did not think that it was poorly written. I agree. And so I, think it's I just well written. Yeah. I think that's one thing I want to make su super clear up front for anybody who might follow along with us or is like listening to this now to say, oh, should I pick this up or not? It is it is not code for poorly written. And I think it's I think people are getting being a little heavy handed with the amount of challenge presented. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. I mean, compared to somebody like Brandon Sanderson, which you and I have both read a lot, mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it, I prefer this prose yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not a big fan of his his writing is you know brandon sanderson is your god as we know but uh, his his writing can be very uh you know straightforward and, and plain and, and a little um, repetitive yes repetitive and it's not something that that i appreciate i i like the uh, i like a great turn of phrase and i think erickson if anything falls on the other side where it's like, sometimes he's a little too flowery and it's like, mm -hmm. well, you could have said that a little clearer, but I do, enjoy, I appreciate the, the prose. I think it's, um, it's, it's, this has been a joy to read. I've really looked forward to cracking my Kindle open every night and, and getting a little more. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's probably true that I have reread sections more than I would in another book that may be something to do with my, with the reputation, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, you got to make, you got to make sure of every detail. Yeah. But I also think that it is the kind of thing where it's like, oh, I'll go back and reread something because now I understand the context of what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to appreciate it more because I'm like, I enjoy that a bit more. And I think that might be, that might be a, crit a legit criticism I have uh, of that style of keeping you in the dark, keeping you in the dark, keeping you in the dark, and then revealing. It's like, well, I wasn't appreciating what was happening as much because I was wondering like the baseline of what it was. That's so interesting. Cause one of the things I felt tempted to like really go through and like even take like keep a notebook and take notes because of the in intimidation factor from the reputation. But one of the things I decided pretty early on in the book was being like, you know, I'm just going to read it the way I'd read a book because I want to sort of validate <laughs> the difficulty claims. Mm. And I almost feel like, if I read this book a second time, those moments of being kept in the dark would be, I'd be more like, ooh, I know something they don't. Right. But the flow I fi have found to be so natural that like finding out with the character, like I have, I actually haven't read, reread any sections because I, I don't feel, I'm trusting that Erickson is going to give me all the details I need when a big thing happens. I expect a big thing to, that, uh, something wouldn't happen in the book that'd be like characters clearly like, this is massive. And me being like, oh, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I, you know, who knows? I got my fingers crossed that that's the case. Um, but <laughs> I, I guess, I guess we'll see. Yeah. I, I feel like I don't need to be in on it. If he's intentionally leaving me in the dark. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, I think that's fair. And I think that's, I think that's kind of what he wants. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's his, optimal journey for the reader is to sort of just jump in with both feet. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and I'm doing that to a certain extent too. I just, I've enjoyed going back and going, oh, okay. Now I get 
that dynamic a bit well, better. Yeah. Well, I like I like that you're doing that. I like that we have two different pro- approaches to yeah. the way we read this book because, you know, everybody reads or approaches reading differently, I find. And so having sort of two perspectives on what got us through the book and the way that we enjoyed the most, I think will be valuable. The other big uh, knock on Erickson is that there are tons of characters and not a lot of characterization. This is something, quote unquote, I did air quotes with my fingers. Um, This is something he has directly rebuked. Uh, He has a very famous um, Facebook post that he did uh, several years ago where he was like, I know how to do characterization, watch. And he like demonstrates it. But um, (laughs) I wonder what your feeling is because we get, I mean, there are a lot of characters, even in the first half of this first book. I'm told that the series has 600 named characters over 10 books, which is pretty mm-hmm. rad. Um, but there's a lot of named characters thrown at us. Did you feel, how did you feel about that? I felt like it was fine. Again, it's one of those moments, and I'm probably gonna say this a million times, I'm just trusting that the names that matter will be repeated. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I, the first I feel very fortunate that I read the Three Body Problem series before this book. Have you read th- those books? No, I've heard they're good though. Oh, they are spectacular, yeah. but they are unlike anything I've ever read before in the sense that the focal point of the story is not on the characters. It is on entire eras. Like the amount of time that spans across those three books is sp- spectacular and difficult to fully envision in in one go it's it's fantastic um and they have tons of named characters but the point is the characters don't matter there's giving a name because it's easier to write a name in in place of well he did this and he did this and then they did this and this and this like that becomes a challenging thing to read so i feel like the named characters i imagine many of them are just means to an end like and i'm basically constantly reading and being like, what is this scene trying to show me and not right. who is this person? And yeah. only when the name comes up a couple times in further chapters, I'm like, that person now matters to me. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't, I, I think having that understanding of, I think that was one good thing going in of like knowing there's this many named characters, but I'm like, is named characters like, and this is not in the book, but like Matilda, the shopkeep, who's there for a second. Like, right. does that count as a name character? Who's saying these name characters? Are they primary characters? Are they focal points of the story? I guess time will tell. For now, seems manageable. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is that uh, that I would put under the heading of, I, I haven't had a problem to that point. I haven't had a problem keeping track of all the characters. And I think one of my bugaboos about the fantasy genre in general is that I like it when when authors name characters in interesting useful ways and I think Erickson for the most part does I mean Tattersail Whiskey Jack those are awesome names Mm -hmm. uh you know uh Anamanda Rake that's that's Dan Brood those are (laughs) rad names and those like evoke something you know then we get into some, you know, there's, there are the fantasy nonsense <laughs> apostrophe names that pop up a lot too, you know, in this Blimey book. So like, mass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, ah, I mean, literally in the prologue, we have a, a, a character that changes her name. We're like, we've met her for Instant- like four sentences. <laughs> I left. Uh, I will say, I was like, if this is an indication of what this book is like, what the heck am I getting into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, wait, I have no contest with this character at all. Well, my name's not uh, Surrey it's not anymore. Surly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Um, anyway, the other thing that I would put under the heading of of challenging or difficult is or maybe disorienting a bit for, especially for people that are used to more sort of uh, straightforward fantasy writing is that there's no indication of who the good guys are, right? Yeah. It, there's no indication of who we should be rooting for. There's characters I really like. And then you, re- you know, in the sort of post star Wars, you know, lifetime that I've had uh, empire bad, right? <laughs> yeah. People against the empire. Good. You know, yeah. Uh, and clearly the Malazan empire is real bad. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's a, they do a lot of things. And yet some of my favorite people in the book are working for, for the empire. Right. And maybe they're being betrayed. And so there's, and everybody has their own perspective on 
what's going on. And there's no real sense of like, you know, what I'm supposed to be rooting for at any given time. I, I know the characters I like and I'm rooting for them to be okay and do well, <laughs> but you know, the sort of more global, there's no clear <laughs> sense of, you know, like we start, maybe we should start getting into spoilers. So yeah. uh, let, let's say this is the designation point. If you haven't read uh, Gardens in the Moon up to 50%, we're gonna spoil s- scenes and characters and moments and plot from this point on. Okay, so the book starts with uh, basically a giant battle. Uh, you know, we, we do some other stuff first, but basically the, so the biggest moment of the beginning of the book is this battle against a moon, people on a moon, which by the, is already sort of a hard concept to wrap your head around. Yeah. It's like a moon that's close enough, I guess, that you could just like get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's already <laughs> kind of hard to wrap your head around. That's one of the things where I'm like, I could go back and try and read the details of what this physically looks like. I'm, but I'm just gonna pay attention to the fact that it's a big, ba- a big battle, and moon spawn could either be a literal giant moon that's close enough. But I like, think it is. I think it's literal. I'm like, or it's. It's just an area, but I like picturing it as a giant moon. That's one of the things I did not go back and be like, I'm going to try and parse. I pictured like a super close moon yeah. that was like tearing into pieces with people like fighting on it and fighting on the planet. And I was like, pretty dope. Pretty dope. Visually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, but what we are literally seeing like the assault of the city pale and we are inside the people assaulting the city, but it's pretty clear that it's a horrible thing that happened. You know, mm-hmm. it's pretty clear that this city has completely been razed to the ground. Later on, we get all the nobles hanged. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. it's an awful situation. And so already it's like, well, yeah, yeah, we won the battle, but also that's pretty terrible <laughs> what we did. You know? <laughs> uh, and I think that that points to the sophistication of the novel. And it, you know, Erickson evidently has a, a history in anthropology and, and loves, uh, you know, world history. And um, I think this speaks to the way these books are going to present it, be presented, it seems to me, is giving you all the sides of these massive conflicts and letting you sort out, like there's, it's all shades of gray. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, war is hell for everybody. And there's all these people trying to stay, uh, have their moral center through it. Like, you know, do Jack one arm is, is trying to be this moral compass in the, inside the fact that he has to do these horrible things. I think that's cool. I think that's interesting, but it's also one of those things that can be a little disorienting because it's like, well, who, you know, who am I which rooting side for? am I supposed to be rooting for here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, like the, the, the whole first section was the, the, the most difficult part for me because they introduced so many people. They kind of bounce between them pretty quickly in the and and that was the part where I was like, yeah, there was a big battle, and I was like, I I know that these people were present because they mentioned it later, but I didn't really <laughs> parse through it in super detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so did did you have? I mean, we we can go through uh the first half, you know, in order, or we could just kind of jump around. And do you mm-hmm. have do you have a favorite character so far through the first fifty percent? Um, it's it's tough. Like the key the key people who. I guess the story, like I'm most interested in like the interweaving of these stories. And uh, I mean, I really like Tattersail as a character. Yeah, she's awesome. I think she's my favorite. <sighs> very, very cool. And But like the the dynamic of, you said Dujek, I was saying Dujek. Um, say, probably, it's you're probably, probably better. I don't know. Uh, so Dujek for me was like the way that this character is described as like he serves the empire but he was also from this army that used to not be part of the empire. And there's so many people that are loyal directly to him that if he like the prowess that he has and the respect that he has earned over the course of his life and military career, if he were to ever be like, nah, empire, we're we're not for you anymore. The empire would have nothing is how he's described. And he seems like a, a tactical and interesting and thoughtful in a way that I really appreciate sort of this shroud of, of reverence that he has everybody talking to him 
um, and where he sort of pops up in, in, uh, the, in the story and from other people's perspective of them not meeting him and just being aware of him in the world, I think is a, he's a cool character. Yeah. <laughs> and then just the one character that I'm like, I don't got really a good read on you is Hairlock. Oh, the yeah, other right? wizard that immediately <laughs> turns into a marionette. I, that it's was like that was the point at the, out, like yelling at people and i'm like oh cool it man <laughs> the point at which his soul gets put into a puppet i was like okay okay this <laughs> this this series isn't going to take itself too seriously and i'm mm-hmm. i'm i'm in i love it i was like you know that that reputation that had come in where it's like you know this this, this you know austere massive book series like oh no there's a puppet wizard you know it's like <laughs> oh okay I, yes, I'm in. This is awesome. I, and, and like, what is, why is this the magic? Like, there's no explanation why, oh, good, we're getting put into a marionette. But it's like, you go in that burlap sack and you come out a marionette. And so yeah. Hairlock is some wizard who's like a no- notorious <laughs> a-hole, basically. They're like, oh, Hairlock, he's crazy and super powerful, but he's going to do bad things, maybe. But maybe he's good. So that's why we saved him. <laughs> yeah. And... Because, uh, sorry, he was a man at the very beginning and he gets sliced in half when they're, awesome. bet- when awesome they're betrayed scene. by magic. Very sick. Uh, or betrayed by the other mage, Tayshren. Yeah. Uh, and Tayshren, I think, thinks he got away with that scot-free. I don't think he saw, he perceives that anybody saw him betray them. <laughs> but yeah. Airlock's like, now a marionette, like, but somehow like running through magical like uh, portals basically that they call warrens. So he's like think, running around in like the gods warrens and like stirring shit up as a puppet and then running out <laughs> being like, the hounds are after me. And you're like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Taking out crows for no, for some yes. reason we don't know yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, you kind of touched on the magic system and I wanted to bring that up. Like that, the warren warrens as to like the source of magic. It's they're They're sort of these like portal passageway, areas but they're also the source of every specific sorcerer's magic and mm-hmm. there's a bunch of different warrens and they're associated with different things and if you ha- you touch a certain warren it's a- so the you know i and love the like hairlock tearing. thing about like what? they have access to certain warrens and certain warrens like your warren is what i can't i can't access that i don't have permissions right. you know yeah it's <laughs> rad and and uh, you know, the chaos warden is like the warden that's off limits and they get Hairlock to go into the chaos warden. So he's already a little off, off base. And then going in there makes him just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, <laughs> yeah. which is awesome. And, um, and you know, the, the, one of the coolest scenes in the first half, uh, you know, really close to the, to the end of the first half is evidently our girl Tattersail mm-hmm. put her soul into the corpse of night something, the other dead a uh, wizard that the guy was carrying yeah. around the burlap set. So yeah. Oh, oh rad. see, I will say that that's one piece that <laughs> I thought she turned herself into a marionette too. It might be. I, cause, I was like, oh, that's. She's like, I see that burlap sack, and you're right. That's what that guy was carrying around was to, like go bury that body. Yeah. But my brain was like, oh, that's the marionette bag. She's now puppet too. <laughs> <laughs> well. She she remembers that she cast the protective ward on the body so that it wouldn't rot too much. Yeah. And that was her like key yeah, to surviving yeah, yeah, yeah. that moment, mm-hmm. uh, which is super rad. Um, so I think, I mean, as much as I love Tattersail, I feel like we're going to see her as like a, a shambling corpse or something, yeah. uh, which is pretty rad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I love her. I love the bridge burners and Whiskey Jack. Clearly, Sorry is a big is going to be a big antagonist here. Yeah. And one aspect that we haven't even touched on yet is, you know, the gods yes. are very much a part of this world. And Opon, the, the sort of two gods of luck or whatever, mm-hmm. are um, and the spinning coin is, is very much the motif that runs through the first half of this book very heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought, there, you know, there's a, a potential for that to be confusing, but I was never really confused by that at all. Like we see yeah. the sort of, physical manifestations of Opon in just a brief scene when they take sorry. And then we kind of keep seeing them influence the world. And I love. Wait, Opon is the one who's like, uh, possessed. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's, I think that's, 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 that's the shadow dark, thorn, right? Yeah, that's, sh- that's the shadow one. Yeah. Shadow. Th- so when th- they, thorn, when, or when throne, you mean they take sorry, 
What do you mean when they take Sorry? The the two those two characters that take that at the very beginning she's on the side of the road with the old woman mm-hmm. and um they they come and they take her and whatever they are the they are gods they yes. are like the awful gods and they in, infuse her with they possess her basically and make her you know everybody's terrified of sorry well I uh, thought and, she got possessed by that witch. And I thought the witch was like a, a an extension of Shadow Throne. The 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 candle lady that dies. Yeah, I think maybe I I that's not what I got. That, oh, okay. that woman's name is Raga, by the way. The okay. the candle lady. I, I trust, thought she, if you read you've read the see this is where you've read like the partners thing. So I trust yeah. what you know <laughs> more than what I know. Well, I mean, this may be funny. I, I think part of the fun of this video series is going to be. Who's and right? I want to do I want to do this at the end is like predicting where the book is going to go, you know, Ooh. as we're reading it. I think it will be fun to like, you know, see what we get wrong or see where where we're where it surprises us. Mm-hmm. Um, but my understanding is that I can't remember the name of those two characters, but um, the uh, the I'm scared to Google it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't want to Google it. either. I'm looking in my. Uh, I think there's two characters that that see her and there one is giggling the whole time. Yeah. Um Yeah, and and anyway, they she's possessed by a god. Everybody seems to think. And everybody's terrified of her, but they still like work <laughs> Whiskey Jack still works with her. It's um, like keep your it gives me the vibes of like keep your enemies closer. They want to keep yeah. their eye on her so that Oh, here it is. Amanos and Cotillion. Oh, Cotillion, yeah. Okay, so Amanos is Shadow Throne. Oh, and Cotillion, is Shadow Throne. Yeah, so they are they are gods, mm-hmm. um, uh, and they they sort of possess her, take her, and possess her, or force her to you know do their bidding, and and Opon, I think, is kind of like working against that and trying to nudge people in certain directions. Like he saves, oh, mm. he they, uh, the the two sides of Opon are male and female. Um, but they, you know, through the spinning coin, like they make sure that Panas, uh, Garros Panas, I don't know what his name is. Ganus um, Paran. Paran, yeah, Paran Panas. Paran, thank you. Um, you know, survives because uh, Sari tries to murder him. Mm-hmm. He survives. And also that whole section in Jerujistan saving uh, that Young assassin? Hand. Oh, I loved that. That chapter or that book, it was it was basically that whole book was like, it felt like an aside where it was like, okay, we're done talking with Tattersail for a yeah. bit and crew. Now we're in Darugistan, which is the city that up until that point, they're like, oh yeah, we have to send people there. We have to take it over. It's the last free city. It's not in the empire is what Darugistan is. Right. Uh, and then you cut to inside Darugistan, people live in their lives. Uh, it starts with like a thief who's going in and like, stealing some jewelry from like the like a noble daughter yeah uh, and getting a little crush while he's there <laughs> um but he's like this like like young dumb dumb thief like going in and like has like a good thieving plan but not anything else really going on it seems like and then he leaves and he's like yeah just hanging out and he's like right in the middle of like or happens to walk out onto the rooftops with like his like loot and two other assassins are like killing each other and then they're like you've seen this now you're dead and he's like what and then right in like the moment he's like watching stuff he he's like wait a coin just fell and like literally like three stooges like huh grabs the <laughs> coin as like crossbow bolts like barely yeah. don't hit him and then he's like oh no and starts running away but this coin is like the symbol of opon these twins and so well, they saved that, him i thought that was an awesome way for a god to influence events is just like look at the shiny thing yes. and then, you know, <laughs> saves saves a person's life yeah uh, and, and then like the chase that ensues and him being like why is this happening to me i just wanted to fence some shit and uh, sorry yeah um, and uh so it was uh, the whole scene was like very like jovial feeling but like intense because it was this big chase scene and like building the world of like oh these rooftops are for the thieves they have like these wires that are built in that look so like cool. cool like so many details about how the sort of the underlying society works around the noble society of Derugistan was like such a cool book and yeah. very lighthearted feeling. 
Loved it. Loved yeah, it. That, that, that leap that he does off the roof to land on the wires, like he knows yeah. the wires are there specifically to like break his fall. So cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that entire cast of characters, the, there, there are scenes that seem to be there just for comedic relief where they're like playing cards and making fun of each other. Mm -hmm. It was a great change of tone. And um, the only things I didn't like about that were the dream sequences, you know, Croup, yeah. I think his name is Croup. Yeah, Croupy or whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I don't like dream sequences in any medium. I always feel like, ah, it's, what is, I, I'm never going to be able to <laughs> figure out what this is. Just get through it. Um, but uh, that, he, sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying, but he's, he's a kind of a fun character too. That group guy who always talks in the third person and is kind of mm -hmm. messing with people all the time. Yeah. Again, that was like another scene. Like I see a dream sequence. I thought the same thing. I'm like, <sighs> a dream sequence, but I'm like, okay, what is, what, um, what's, I like to call him croupy just cause he, he speaks in third person and it sounds like much more childish and he seems to be a very childish person. You may be right. I, again, I don't know how to, I think it could be croup, but being like, mm, croupy sure is hot outside. Looks like you've got some <laughs> wine. Wouldn't mind that. And like, shut up, yeah. croupy. <laughs> um, uh, in the dream sequences, like the thing that I took away from that is like, okay, this person who everybody perceives as s only sort of lovable, dumb, dumb, uh, uh, who's like, like very self-absorbed has bigger sort of strategic motivations, even though we don't know what they are. And I'm just yeah. like, I'm not going to try and interpret your dream. I don't care that much. What I, what, what this is showing me is that you're a deeper, more thoughtful person than anybody around you perceives you to be. Right. And so you're an interesting person who, when I'm looking through somebody else's eyes, what is this character saying? How are they behaving? And what is that likely mean because of the way that i know that they think more deeply about things than this character perceives them too yeah yeah and evidently he's the one that trained crocus Younghand or is training mm -hmm. uh the, you know the the thief and i, I you're right drujistan to me was such an awesome uh you know diversion or excursion or, or mm -hmm. deviation from what we've been doing and it, it was like oh man the, the idea of this city where it happens to be sitting on top of this like natural gas reserve. And so they piped it into all of the nooks and crannies of the city. So there's all this blue flame everywhere. Mm -hmm. Such a rad visual to have in your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not keeping track. There's a lot of discussion of like where the planes are and how, how that relates <laughs> to the lake. And you know, I don't have any of that geography in my head. But I definitely see those cities and they have character and they have identity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a strength of the book too, is that the places feel alive, mm -hmm. uh, especially Drujistan. Um, but even pale and, and you know, this idea of, it's such a wild thing to have this moon as part of it. Yeah. And we get, you know, we get POV from a crow, you know, crone, this, this, this giant crow. When I first started reading, like I thought, a familiar, oh, is this a basically. dragon? It's gonna be a yeah. dragon. <laughs> a giant crow. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. that's that's a wild thing. I mean, I'm so in. I'm really digging it. I really thought, you know, people say, oh, the second book is so much better, and the third book is like blow your mind, is like one of the greatest books ever. That's where it really it really takes off. But man, I, I'm having a blast so far. I'm really into it. Yeah, same. Yeah, same. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. So what do you, th where do you think we're going? Cause I think one of the things that's pretty <laughs> wild and fun about this experience is I have no idea where this book is going. Yeah. I could like take some random guesses, but only because you, you asked me, like if I'm, I'm not sitting, like this is not a book where I'm like, I see what's happening. And I think so much of that is because it, sh it does show things from multiple perspectives. Like you have characters that are for the empire, not for the empire, but many of them, even whether they're for or against the empire, are all trying to like infiltrate Darugistan for some reason. But then it also yeah. shows Darugistan being like a pretty cool place, just doing its thing. So you're like, you feel like you're rooting for everyone, whoever you're looking through the eyes of. There's only like two people that I feel like I'm distinctly not rooting for, and that's Sorry and Tayshren. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Those are the only two people I know suck. Those villains. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wouldn't be surprised if that turns around. Like, where are we going? The the thing that I mean, the biggest thing that strikes me is that we haven't really touched on is the, I guess, this entire race of zombies. Oh, dude! <laughs> the by the way, mass. rad, very rad sick. debut. Where it like it comes up from the ground and skewers that dude. Yeah, Ugh. 
sick. Amazing. Yeah. And, and it, clearly they are, uh, you know, a, a real difference maker. And, and, and Lorne, the adjunct, is, is, has some plan that everybody's scared, but nobody really knows what her, she's up to. Mm-hmm. And sometimes way, it doesn't seem like she even quite knows what she's up to. Like yeah. she's talking with this Talani Mass and she's like, whoa, sick that you're here. And he'll be like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And say some facts. She's like, nobody's nobody's known that before. I'm like the first person to know this information. <laughs> so she's clearly got a plan, but she's also like, this is pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's all this talk about them releasing the the traitor uh, or the yes. tyrant. The tyrant. Uh-huh. Um, releasing the tyrant that's been uh, like imprisoned for 3000 years, years or something. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like that's bad. That's yeah. a bad idea. <laughs> uh, anything named the tyrant, no matter who you are, what your plan is, you're not like, could they really just be a tyrant though? Could that be bad if the whole world, I guess at some point banded yeah. together to imprison the tyrant, and, you know what? And- Go release them. Do it. And do it's it. cute how Perrin in his cute little head, he's just like, there's no way she's going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> she hired me to lead the bridge burners. She wouldn't do that. I this, love it. Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> so like, if I had to guess anything, actually, this is something that kind of gave me uh, 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 Mistborn vibes or like Mistborn seemed like maybe inspired by it. This Talani Mas reminded me of, I mean, I haven't read this book in so long, so I'm probably going to get it wrong. But like the reveal of the the coloss of mm. like that race of globs that if you like shove metal in them, they turn into people mm-hmm. in Mistborn of being like, wow, that's a thing. All of us didn't know that. We were just scared of it. That the Talani Mas as like a race that's like, we're coming back and we're all gonna start <laughs> coming back. <laughs> yeah. uh, gave me those kind of vibes of like something people only like remember about, but didn't think there any were anymore, and they're all going to start coming back. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm 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 sensing that you know we haven't really seen Anamanda Rake or Caladan Brood mm-hmm. much. We've had just a couple of scenes with them so far. I or sense just they're the going to be poetry at the beginning, or like the tiny blurbs with Caladan, right? At the beginning of things. Um, I'm sensing that they're going to be big parts of, I mean, Mm -hmm. one of the reasons is I've seen a cover of Gardens of the Moon with uh, Anna Amanda Rake on it. And it's like, well, that seems like a pretty big character if you're going to put him on the cover. (laughs) Um, I feel, I, but they have such cool names and they, they, they are described as being so powerful. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, and my understanding is they're on opposite sides. Yeah. They're against each other. So and they both sound rad. So it's like, I don't know which of these guys I want to, I'm rooting and, for here. And the crone works for both of them. Kind yeah. Of, which, yeah. I, the, which is the crow, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Uh, and Amanda Rake, if I have this correctly, he's like the moon lord. Right. Uh, so yeah. he, he lives on the moon? Question the Tisty ND or the, the yeah, Tisty ND? Yeah. yeah. And then Kaladin Brood uh, is like a like a like he's a warlord he's a like a general and he's got like a bunch of armies and he's somewhere yeah. else in the world doing i think he has the crimson guard is what the crimson is. guard yeah, yeah. so yeah he's but doing he's like doing a whole thing. campaign that we're not even looking at yet yeah he's like just over there fighting. yeah and people are like he's powerful and you're like okay <laughs> yeah supposedly the it. the supposedly the second book takes place on a completely different continent so it's like and then, oh, and then yeah. the third book comes back to Genabacus, where we, which is where yeah. we are, um, but it's it's massive. I mean, there's it really does feel like a whole world, you know, at play, at war, and I, I mean, it's thrilling. I, but it's also like got these real fun character moments. It's got you know, you know, goofy little uh, scenes. It's got mm-hmm. you know, fun individual character moments. Like you said, the the scenes on the rooftops in Jerusalem are so fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm digging it. Yeah. I mean, I I'm really glad because I was worried that, you know, we were gonna have to slog through this and not enjoy it. But I'm so <laughs> glad you're having a good time. I'm Let me tell you, I would. I, I remember know you when you would. messaged me about it, I like sent you like the link, like, is this it? And you're like, that's all the books. Maybe wait to see if we like it. And I was like, I'm committed already. Like I'm going to power through this, whether you power through it with me or not. So I am happy that we're having a good time. And if I, these get better and better, like Bring it on, baby. Yeah, people say that the last book uh, is is one of the greatest works of fantasy ever 
right? You know, I'm like, I'm so excited. And, but it's supposedly like 3.3 million words all, all told the whole t- series. Yeah. Serious yeah. business. Did I get, I, I want to see, that's the one thing about the Kindle that I think is like a, a nice thing about it, but also I, I want to see them I'm like, What's yeah. the size of this book I'm reading? How how thick is this? When they're all together, are they this big? Are they this big? What yeah. ten books that are like these beefy boys? I want. I can't wait to see them. I already picture them on my shelf, but I don't know what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I think that I think they get bigger from here. I think this is one of the shortest ones. Is Guardians nice. of the Moon. So yeah, I'm 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 super in. I would love for folks uh, that might be going along this journey with us to tell us their experience. Are you also enjoying it? Had you heard about uh, Gardens of the Moon? Had you heard about uh, Malaz and Books of the Fallen? Um, I, this is super awesome. I love talking books with you, Lana. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I would love to leave folks also with maybe a recommendation of something you've read in the past that you uh, might be under the radar for people, might be a, a fun book to, uh, to just, you know, put in your good reads to read list. I, one of my favorite things in the world is just building out my two reads, you know, mm-hmm. eh, reading them, it, it may happen. It may not, but <laughs> I know I want to read them. I'm very bad at that. I should get a good read so that I could actually start like, maybe this will be the thing that will make me do it is at the end of these, I'll add one of those books to my good reads and then I'll have one. Uh, don't have one. I have like a, a notes on my phone. That's just like random book titles. Uh, I mentioned this once as like a parting gift on DLC main show, but I just finished the series and I really enjoyed the whole thing. Um, uh, the first book is called a shadow in summer. And oh yeah. This is the David, uh- Da- Daniel Abraham. Daniel book. Abraham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's book one of the Long Price Quartet. And it, the first book, uh, it's all about this. It's sort of po- like political intrigue, but in a fantasy setting, uh, in a world where like the only people who do magic basically are called poets and they're called poets because they speak into existence. They, they use words to speak into existence, a, a concept. And that concept hardens as some, a creature called an end dot that is able to do a specific task. So they're the end dots names might be stone made soft. So, and they, the, the city that has stone made soft, they're a, a mining city because Mm. they can easily go through the mountain so that's like the only point of magic in this world and then the political intrigue that swirls around this in sort of the 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 courts of these cities and then across continents uh is very very interesting and cool in a society where they they use their their hands and their postures to communicate as much as their words so rad because of some of the 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 specific jargony, like fantasy jargon that's in the beginning, it starts off almost like this book, pretty heavy handed where you're like, this is like annoying to read, but it just sort of sets it up. So you know that this is how they're functioning all the time. And it tapers off pretty quickly. There's four books in the series. I loved all four of them. Um, Highly recommend a shadow in summer, Daniel Abraham. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to recommend a a book that I would consider fantasy, but might not be in that section in the bookstore. Uh, it's called The Bone Clocks. It's by David Mitchell. Uh, David Mitchell is a writer I love. Literary writer, just gorgeous, gorgeous prose. I mean, spectacular wordsmith. Uh, and Bone Clocks is an awesome book that basically each section jumps forward like I think 10 years. And you start uh, in, I don't know, I think it's the 80s. And by the end, you're in the future. Uh, and it is so beautifully written. The characters are so compelling. I absolutely loved it. It is, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but it is a, an amazing, I mean, I read it so fast. I, I devoured that book and I love anything that David Mitchell writes. So an author to check out the bone clocks is, uh, I, he also wrote Cl- cloud Atlas, mm. um, which became a movie cloud Atlas. I enjoyed a lot too, but not as much as the bone clocks. I thought the bone clocks was fantastic. So um, there's a couple of other recommendations for you. We'd love to hear your book recommendations. We'd love for you to take part, participate. We have a forum on the Discord specifically for the book club. 
Uh, you can find the Discord. It's 5 by 5 DLC on Discord. And uh, there's a, a book club. There's uh, what you've been reading section and a section specifically for Gardens of the Moon if you want to talk about that. I think we're going to maybe break it into um, the first half and second half so you can talk about the stuff we talked about this episode without worrying about spoiling the second half or being spoiled for the second half. And then when we do our next episode about the second half of the book, uh, we'll have a separate uh, thread there as well. Um, I I'm, I love reading and I'm glad we're doing this. So mm -hmm. thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Lana, for being here with me. Thanks for inviting me. I can't Absolutely. wait to continue on this journey, y'all. All right, we'll see you guys next time. And uh, thanks for reading with us.